episode. Wonder why you got up. I'm <laughs> 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 oh, happened. Okay, I think it's spotlight me. <laughs> yeah, the recording was really good. You could hear really well. Uh, it should be even better. Um, I was finding that listening to people's comments, it was kind of hard for the people online to hear. So we got a mic, a new mic. Oh. So it's not recording here, but it's recording there. My so. comments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Spotlight like myself. <laughs> So welcome everybody. Glad people are hanging in there. Uh, this, so this is our fourth session, and I'm going to apologize a little bit for last session because last session was a little dry. We went through the history and the three-year school. So uh, I'm hoping to make this one a little more lively and a lot more questions. And I found the secret to that is to reduce my material. Right? If we've got way too much material to cover, it just away. So, um, so if you don't mind. If you could join me in Gusha, I'd cite the Nembutsu. And I'm going to talk about the Nembutsu a little bit more today. So for those of you who don't know, we'll talk about what this is. Uh, Namami no. Namami no. Thank you. Everybody online can see that okay? So, yeah. thanks. So today we're gonna talk in our fourth session uh, about um, Dodo Shinju. So the first session we talked about the life of Shakyamuni Buddha, historical Buddha. The second session we talked about some of the major concepts. Last week, we talked about the three, pure la uh, three schools of Buddhism. So Mahayana, Theravada, and Vajrayana, and then how it spread through Asia. And, and this session, we're gonna switch from sort of a general Buddhism talk to more to talk about Jodo Shinshu or our school of Buddhism. Uh, and so I wanted to spend the majority of the time talking about the founder of our school, Shinran Shonin, um, but um, I thought we should first introduce what Jodo Shinshu is, uh, because for some of you, you might not know. Uh, so the Jodo Shinshu school is, Jodo Shinshu is translated as the true essence of the Pure Land teaching. Okay. So the Pure, it's a school of Pure Land Buddhism, uh, and it was titled by Shinran Shonin, um, the true essence of the Pure Land teaching. So it is a sub uh, school of Mahayana Buddhism. So remember the three divisions, Mahayana Buddhism started in India, became very, very prominent in China. And then from China it went to Korea and then to Japan. And so the major forms of Buddhism that was imported into Japan was Mahayana Buddhism. And through the history of Japan, we talked about this last time, but um, the uh, major schools from China uh, were Mahayana Buddhism, and they divided into various sects. And Jodo Shinshu is a, along the Pure Land line of Buddhism. Um, so the founder, we're going to talk about this fellow. His uh, name is Shinran Shoni. And uh, last year, we celebrated the 851st year of his birth. Well, last year was 850, so this year it's 851. So he was born 850 years ago, quite a long time ago in Japan. Uh, it's the largest sect of uh, school of Buddhism in Japan. Uh, and there's around 12 million people who practice the Jodo Shinshu worldwide. Uh, that includes Japan, but also in places like North America, Brazil, uh, various places. Now the object of reverence, the main Buddha that we Revere is actually uh, Amida Buddha. 
And I wanted to take a minute to talk about the difference between Amida Buddha and Shakyamuni Buddha, because that's something that even in my early 20s, I really didn't have any idea about, uh, even though I was Jodo Shinshu Buddhist for all that time. So my assumption when I was growing up is the Buddha statue on our shrine is the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, but it's not. It's actually a Buddha by the name of Amida Buddha. Uh, so Shakyamuni Buddha, of course, is the historical Buddha, the Buddha that was born 2,600 years ago in India. He really started the whole uh, Buddhism religion. Sh Amida Buddha is a Buddha that Shakyamuni Buddha talked about in many of his Dharma talks. So he talked about this primordial Buddha, this Buddha who existed eons and eons ago. Okay? So he tells this story several times, but mostly in a sutra called the Larger Sutra. And he talks about this Buddha who was born a king. He gives up his uh, state as a king and he wants to try to become enlightened. So he gets advice from various Buddhas. And the advice is number one, if you want to be a Buddha, you have to create a pure land. And so the Buddha, this, um, his name is Dharmakara, goes on to try to practice to become enlightened, and in doing so, creates this perfect pure lad. It's called Skavati. Anyway, so it's a pure lad. Uh, he actually practices for five kalpas, and a kalpa is 4.2 billion years. So it's said that he actually practiced for 21 billion years. Obviously a myth, but... Um, and in his process of becoming enlightened, in his process of trying to become a Buddha, he actually makes 48 vows, right? Uh, and the 48 vows will probably, will, I mean, we will go over next week, uh, not in too much detail, but one of the vows is called the primal vow or 18th vow. So Amida Buddha is considered sort of the primordial or the um, essential Buddha uh, that Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha talked about over and over again. And so he's the object of reverence in our school of Buddhism. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about Shinra. So the main teachings in Jodo Shinshu in our sect of Buddhism is to listen to the teachings of the Buddha, whether we're talking about the historical Buddha or Amida Buddha, uh, to entrust in their compassion. And that's considered really a central component of our understanding because we have to trust in the compassion of Amida Buddha or the historical Buddha. And then there's something called the Nembutsu. That's what we did at the beginning of uh, this talk. Uh, so we, we recite the Nembutsu as a grateful response, as a show of gratitude towards the compassion of the Buddha. Okay. And I'll talk about how that's a little bit different than the rest of Pure Land schools in a minute. So this is our statue. So if you go into our Hondo, uh, we have a nice setup, but the golden Buddha in the middle is Amida Buddha. So it's not the historical Buddha, but it's Amina Buddha. If you go to Buddhist temples around the world, you'll see all kinds of different Buddhas as a central figure. Um, but in Jodo Shinshu temples, 99% of them, the central figure should be either Amida Buddha or his name written in the Chinese kanji characters, um, or it can be a picture of him, right? So a painting, for example, of him. So that's the central object of uh, reverence. So the mother temple um, is in Kyoto, Japan, and it's a place called Nishihonganji. And it's a temple that was actually built partly because of political wranglings, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but by a daimyo by the name of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. So, um, Nishi Hon uh, Honganji as a main temple was uh, at one point moved to Osaka. Everybody probably knows Osaka in Japan. And it was in a very strategic location. And a fellow by, by the name of Oda Nobunaga, who was a daimyo, uh, actually fought with uh, Honganji for 10 years. And it, Honganji finally relented, gave up the land. But then his successor, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, said, okay, I'm going to give you this plot of land in Kyoto, and you can, and he helped Honganji build a mother temple there. And that's where the current mother temple is in Kyoto now, the site where Toyotomi Hideyoshi uh, donated the land. 
Another thing that you might not know is the fact that Jodo Shinshu as a sect of Buddhism in the in 1500s split. So they became an east side and a west side of Honganji. And it was because of political um, difficulties that I'll talk about. Uh, so Higashi Honganji, uh, the uh, eastern Honganji, uh, the land and the building was actually made by Tokugawa Ieyasu, the first shogun, well, not the first shogun, but the shogun. So if you're watching this miniseries Shogun on TV, uh, that's the shogun that we're watching well, right now. Right? So in 1500, roughly, there was a split between the east and the west side of Honganji. Basically, they divided the congregation, so the followers, into half, and therefore diluted the power of the Honganji. So currently today, uh, if you go to Kyoto, there's the Nishi Honganji, and four blocks away, there's a Higashi Honganji. And they look almost identical in their structure, which is amazing because if you walk in, you think, well, this is a duplicate of the other one. Uh, they're slightly different, but. For Jodo Shinshu, especially Nishi Honganji side, there's 10,000 uh, 10, temples in Japan. And the sad thing is when they did a recent survey of the 10,000 temples, it's estimated that probably about 2,000 will be closed in the next 15 years. That's because many of them are in very rural locations, very small villages, congregations are down to maybe 20 or 30 people. And so the estimate is that we'll probably lose about 20% of those temples in the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, there are 10 temples in Canada. Can anybody name all 10 temples? David, do you know them all? Well, Steve's from Vancouver. Yeah. Vernon, Kamloops, Kelowna. Kelowna, that's five. Calgary and Lethbridge. Calgary and Lethbridge, so that's seven. Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Uh, Toronto. I don't know if Hamilton and Montreal are still there. Yeah, so Hamilton uh, did have a temple, but about seven years ago, I guess now, they actually closed their temple and they're practicing in the community hall. Well, Actually, in Burlington. North Bay, I guess. Or uh, Ottawa? Is that what I'm No, not North Bay. Uh, at the end of Lake Superior. Thunder Bay? Thunder, Thunder Bay. Bay. So Thunder Bay has a fellowship as well. Yeah. The one that you missed is Fraser Valley. So Fraser Valley has uh, oh, yeah. a temple as well. It's so still open. Uh, it's still open, yeah. yeah. They actually did a major refurbishment. They had a fire. When was that? About 12 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And then they rebuilt it. So it's actually quite a nice building structure now. So it's interesting that if you look at the distribution of the temples in Canada, eight are in Alberta or West, and only two are in Eastern Canada. And the main reason for that is, of course, because when the Japanese population came to Canada, they mostly settled on the West Coast. They were fishermen, farmers. And then with the internment process in the war, many of them moved to Alberta or forced to move to Alberta. Uh, so most of the temples actually were built in the Western part of Canada and only a very few exist in the East. But there was settlement here from the early 1900s. Before, before the internment, yes, absolutely. If you look at the US, it's a very similar situation. So they have 110 temples between Hawaii and the US uh, mainland. Uh, so in Hawaii, there's around 35, 36 temples, and the rest are in the US. 80% of the temples in the mainland US are on the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, Canada, three, three Sangha groups. Yeah. What is. So the Sangha groups are groups that meet together regularly, but they don't have a building. Uh -huh. right? So an example would be Hamilton now. Okay. Ottawa and Montreal are the three other uh, main Sangha groups. In Canada. So then that would be 13, then, like including those. There's 13 places. groups. 13 yes. groups. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 13 or 14, depends on how you count it. How long has Ottawa been oh, I don't know, David. Actually, that's a good question. The minister from Toronto has been going to Ottawa, um, depending on the month, once a month or once every other month. And if you look at the most recent picture, they have about 20 members that meet regularly in a community hall. Oh, when you say sign group, so they don't have the regular 
They don't do not. Uh, in fact, if you look at the 10 temples across Canada, there's six ministers now. There was five, and then a, a new fellow, a brand new graduate, started in Toronto two days ago. Yeah. Do you, you don't count uh, the, well, what's her name, is June in the army? Oh, uh, Joanne. Joanne. Uh, uh, I don't. She would be the seventh uh, ordained minister in Canada, but she's actually a chaplain with the armed forces. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, sorry to interrupt. That's okay. But uh, why does she not get included with all our other children? Uh, well, she is, for example, with the coming AGM, she's coming and she's going to be going through an education. It's mostly because of her schedule, because as a chap brand new chaplain, brand new officer of the armed forces she's got a pretty hectic uh schedule she just started october right uh, yeah. last year so she's really she brand new in the position better pension than you guys oh yeah better pension <laughs> better, pay, <laughs> better benefits. <laughs> she chose wisely <laughs> but she's the first um canadian uh chaplain officially of the Bo buddhist, buddhist. Uh, yeah. yeah buddhist chaplain and she's by far the first uh, chaplain in the Canadian military uh, of, of a Buddhist set. So she's in Kingston right now. She's a lovely lady. Uh, and then there are Jodo Shinshu temples in Brazil. There's uh, about six in Brazil. Uh, Europe, there's three. Uh, Australia, there's one. Hong Kong, there's about four, actually. And they were built historically when Japan occupied Hong Kong. Um, and then there's one in Mexico City, one in Kathmandu in Nepal. Uh, so remember, Nepal is a Buddhist country. So there's many, many Buddhist temples in Nepal, but there's only one Jodo Shinshu temple in Nepal. Is Reverend Watanabe still the minister? Australia? Australia? Yeah, he is. He's actually still very active. Uh, he has a really growing sangha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and he's in Auckland. Yeah. And then uh, there's some Jodo Shinshu temples now in India. So India, remember, India uh, Buddhism dies out in India, but there's a re real resurgence in parts of India of Buddhism, and one of the temples is a Jodo Shinshu temple. Yeah. Do you know, uh, about the 1960s, I think, somebody in India, I think it was Ramana Maybe, uh, a couple, sent her son or a boy from India to to retrain with uh, Japanese groups in tradition because it had died out in India. Right. Do you know what happened to him? I, I don't. Because he was a holy terror. <laughs> he was in and out of the police station a lot. Oh. <laughs> what, happened, <laughs> what happened when he grew up? I mean, I think if he grew up, uh, I think he's, if he straightened up, he'd be a good minister. Oh, <laughs> people were really, totally, really, totally, 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 and they converted to Pure Lad and they studied in Japan uh, and became ministers. And so they're running a, a temple in Nepal in Kathmandu right now. Anyways, but I don't know about the fellow you're talking about. The three main sutras that Jodo Shinshu follows, and we're going to talk about this next week, is the larger sutra, the contemplation or meditation sutra, and the Amida sutra. And we'll go get into those sutras uh, next week. So this is the gate at Nishihongaji. Sorry, the uh, pictures are a little bit blurry. I couldn't get clearer images. Uh, I never see, I've been to Nishihonganji many, many times, and I never see the gate look like this because the gate is almost always open, right? It's never closed. And so uh, you don't see it closed very often. But, uh, and this is the inside of Nishihonganji. So this huge courtyard after you enter the gate. And that's Brenda and Charlotte in 2019, in front of a hall called the Goedo Hall, so the Founders Hall. 
and the Founders Hall was built in 1636. Um, and there's something about the Founders Hall that I found out after researching for this talk that I didn't know, so I'll tell you about that. And then beside it is a smaller hall. Uh, it's about 80% of the Founders Hall, and it's called the Amida Hall. And the Amida Hall, actually the central figure of uh, the statue is Amida Buddha, like our temple. And it was built in 1760. Do you know anything about the tree? The I don't, except for it is a Bodhi tree, but I don't know when it would have been planted there in Nishanganji. Yeah, you've been there, David. You were there last year. Yeah. Um, so the interesting about Nishihonganji, the main halls, uh, there was a major refurbishment about 10 years ago. Uh, so they took down the roof, they redid all the tiles, they did redid much of the upper part of the structures of Nishihonganji. And, uh, and yet if you look at it, it looks like it's something from four or 500 years ago. So even though they've reconstructed it, added new electrical systems and mm. you know ventilation and all that stuff, modernized the inside, the outside still looks like it did historically. Uh, this is a picture diagram of the temple complex. And so there's the Gyodo Hall, uh, Goedo Hall. So that's the central building in the compound. And next to it is the Amida uh, Hall. This takes up about three city blocks, just so you know. So it's a fairly large area that it encompasses. The area that's accessible by the public is actually just this front part though. And the rest of it, you have to have special permission to go see it. And you have to be from an, or you have to be an ordained minister or from a minister's family. And you have to write months in advance to get access to the rest of uh, Nishihonganji. There's a beautiful garden in the back. I've seen it only once. My aunt took us uh, back there. Uh, and it's quite a beautiful garden, but public don't have access to it. Um, so that is the main structure. There's administrative buildings. There's actually a visitor center in front. Um, there's sort of ceremonial buildings in the back. So that's the main campus, as it were, of Nishihonganji. But beside it, outside of that three block, and there's a gate all the way around that uh, three block section, there's actually many, many buildings that belong to Nishihonganji. For example, there's a building called Mombo Kaikan. It's a hotel. It's a hotel specifically built for people who are there to do business with Nishihonganji. It's about a four or five story hotel. It has about a hundred rooms. Um, it's really quite luxurious. It's really nice. Uh, and the thing is, is that if you can show that you're from a Jodo Shinshu temple, you can actually stay there. And the cost of staying there, uh, I just looked this up, is a hundred dollars US a night, which for a hotel in Kyoto is actually quite reasonable. So if, if you're there, uh, and if you can think about ahead of time, because then you have to get a minister sign a certificate saying you're from a Jodo Shinshu family or temple, um, then you can actually stay there for, for cheaper. Uh, around this neighborhood, and you'll get a chance to see it both the options this summer. That's where you'll stay for at least three or four days. Yeah. Um, so around that area though, uh, for about three or four blocks, um, Nishihonganji, owns many other buildings. So there's the International Center for uh, Jodo Shinshu Studies. Um, there are many residences. I think there's four residences for visiting uh, ministers and monks to stay if they want to and study. They have classrooms, they have all kinds of other things. Uh, just across the street from Nishihonganji is the best um, shop that sells skimono. I don't know if people <laughs> skimono, but wow. Uh, skimono is uh, pickled vegetables, and it's amazing. So anytime I go to Nishihonganji, I always stop at the pickle shop. It's world famous. Yeah. Who is the famous tea house in Uh It's one of the back buildings. I one know. Of those back buildings. Yeah, because you don't. The public doesn't have access to it, but I don't know which one it is. Oh, they don't. I've been there, but I don't know how I got it. Got in, but they, they don't they open it? 
someone yes they will open the tea house several times a year yeah. and you have to have sort of tickets in advance in order to go in to see it i think but i, I mean i don't know i've, I've actually not seen the tea house so, so well, my junior yeah. education to become a minister was were any of your classes or did you no so we were in a different uh temple um it's called the training temple in japan uh, so that's where we did most of it but i was ordained in Nishihonganji in the main hall okay. yeah so that's where our ordination ceremony is i'll show you the hall so that's the hall that i got ordained in so that's the inside of that the biggest structure um it's a Beautiful building. The interesting thing is the floor is a seamless tatami mat. So tatami mats usually come in sections. This one is a huge tatami mat that is doesn't have sections. It's all one built as one. Um, so tatami mats, for those of you who know, are made out of rice straw, traditionally. Uh, although this might be synthetic, I don't know. Um, and this main hall area will hold about a thousand people. And you'll notice something, there's no chairs. So in Japan, of course, you sit on the floor with your legs folded. Um, it's not true that there's no chair. There's no chairs in the main part. So on the back and on the sides, we'll have chairs for foreigners, <laughs> for those of us. And when we went through our ordination ceremony, um, we were given the choice of sitting on the floor. Our ordination ceremony took about an hour and a half. And so we could sit with our legs folded, but we could also use chairs. So they allowed us to use chairs because most Westerners aren't used to sitting on the floor like that. And we would be in a lot of pain. <laughs> um, so the thing that I didn't know, I've, I'd been in this hall uh, over a half a dozen times. I was ordained there. Uh, we, we used to go there when I was a kid. But the thing that I didn't realize until preparing this talk is the central figure, the statue in the Goedo Hall is not Amida Buddha, but it's a statue of Shinra. And I had no idea. That's It's the only, supposedly the only Jodo Shinshu temple that actually has Shinra as the central figure statue and not Amida Buddha. So it's really interesting. And I should have guessed because it's a sitting figure. It's not a standing figure. And, for those of you who don't know, Jodo Shinsha temples, the Amida statue is always standing. Um, but it's a sitting figure and it's actually Shinra. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so here's another statue of Shinra, the founder of our sect, and it's actually in New York. So it's actually a place called the New York Buddhist Temple. It was donated from uh, Hiroshima to New York, the state of New York, in 1950. So it's short, fairly shortly after the born. And the story of this Shinran statue is it was in Hiroshima at a temple that was just over one kilometers from the detonation site of the atomic bomb. And so that area, of course, was decimated. None, no evidence of the physical structure of the temple that it was at existed. It all burnt down and was demolished. Um, but the statue remained. The statue remained completely intact. And so as a peace offering, um, the uh, Hiroshima government actually donated the statue to the state of New York and the state of New York then uh, erected it at the site of the New York Buddhist temple. So it's supposed to be quite an amazing statue to see, of course. Is there one here in this building or uh, There's one in the front. So there's actually two statues of Shinran at the front. Um, so the one is Shinran as a traveling monk, so he has the hat, traditional hat on. Um, and then there's a statue of, uh, who is it? The Buddha, baby Buddha. Yes, the baby Buddha is the other statue in front. In our main altar, and in most Jodo Shinshu temples, if you look at the altar, the central figure is Amida, the golden statue. To the right, as you're facing it, is almost always Shinran. A scroll or a painting of Shinran. And so that's what Shinran looked like when he was in the 80s. And there's many, many depictions of Shinran shown. So we'll talk about him and his life for a little bit. How do we know about his life? Uh, it was actually a really well written biography about this man by his great grandson. So his great grandson was a fellow by the name of Kakunyo. And in 1295, 
he wrote on a set of 88 scrolls, the history of Shinran's life. Uh, and so that's really the main source of information that we have about his life. But there was also his wife left uh, 10 letters that were discovered in 1921 uh, called Eshinin's letters. So we got a lot of information about him from those letters. And of course, from his own writings. And quite a bit of his writings survived in terms of his like handwritten uh, major writings. So that's where we get most of the information. So these Godensho, these scrolls about Shinran's life are actually displayed in Nishihonganji once a year at Hongko time. That's the memorial service for Shinran. They actually bring out these scrolls that are 800 years old basically, and they display them. And so people can actually go up and read them. In addition to writing the history on scrolls though in Chinese characters, um, Kakunyu also had, he didn't draw them himself, but he had a set of uh, pictorial uh, graphics of, you know, so it's like a picture book. So there would be the history part of explaining like his birth, and then there would be pictures depicting his birth. And so those are called the Goen, Goeden, and the Goeden is also displayed uh, at New Year's uh, on January the 16th, and for about a week uh, around that special ceremony in Ahonganji. And I'll show you some of the Goeden. Uh, the Goeden is the pictures, of course, and it was written on 88 scrolls. And there are, it's divided, so each scroll has four different scenes. And it's a different scene about Shinran's life as he grew up. And this is a soul syrup, so it would be something like this. Sorry, it's kind of blurry, but you know, it, there would be the accompanying words describing what was happening, and then there would be a picture that was drawn. So that's how we know about Shinran Shonin and his life. That's the main source. So Shinran Shonin was born in May of 1173. And that was a real uh, time of unrest in Japan. So around 1185, so just a few years after he was born, something major happened in Japan. Does anybody know? It's, it was actually the development of the first shogun. So remember, Japan was ruled by an imperial family, emperor, and then around 1185 is when the very first shogun took over, a warlord took over uh, Japan and established himself as the great ruler. Uh, there was lots of uh, famines during that time. There was an epidemic during that time where quite a few people in Japan passed away. So it was a real time of unrest for uh, he was born as Watsu, Matsuwaka Maru, uh, and his last name was Arinori, and his family was actually part of the imperial court, so they were the lower officials of the imperial court, but um, they had status. So. Um, but as a young child, uh, Shinran lost both his parents. So we know that his mother died when he was six, and the theory is, is that his father died when he was nine. Uh, there is some historians that believe his father actually didn't die and that he actually joined Shinran in becoming a monk, but that hasn't been collaborated. And usually the temples in Japan would have kept meticulous records about who became a monk. Uh, and so the theory is, is that his father and mother both died when he was nine. So he was left in the care of his uncles. And it's said that Shinran himself requested to become a monk, right? So he said, uncle, I want to go be a monk please take me to get ordained. But the fact is, is that we also know in Japan at that time, because it was a time of extreme turmoil and poor economic state, um, that many children who were orphaned were sent to become monks, right? Because the family couldn't support them. And so the only way, there was no orphanages in Japan. So the de facto orphanages were in fact temples. And so, it, yeah, David. So he was ordained as a, as a Buddhist monk? as a Buddhist monk. Okay, so he just altered the Buddhism. Yes, okay. so he was ordained as a Tendai monk. So Tendai, of course, was the major uh, school at that time in Japan. Okay. And he was ordained at the age of nine by a fellow by the name of Jiqin. Jiqin uh, was the central abbot of the Tendai monastery. So he was quite a high level uh, person that actually ordained Shinran. Um, and his Dharma name that he was given was Hanet. 
The story about his ordination, though, is that uh, Shinran went to get ordained, and it was in the middle of like at 10 o'clock at night. And Jichin said, well, I'll ordain you, but let's put off this ordination until tomorrow. And Shinran said, no, I want to get ordained tonight. And so he wrote this poem, like cherry blossoms are the minds that think there is a tomorrow, but who can tell there may be a tempest in the night? So the idea here was is that cherry blossoms might be in full bloom, but if there's a tempest in the night, it will all get blown away by morning. In a similar way, I might be all going to be a minister and a monk today, but who knows overnight, I might change my mind. So let's do it tonight. So the story goes is that he was ordained at about midnight. So our ordination ceremonies at Nishihonganju, I'll show you the hall that we got ordained in. Uh, when we get ordained, uh, they turn off all the lights. And our ordination ceremony happens with a single candle. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge hall. And so it's basically pitch black. They shut all the windows and the curtains and everything so it's dark. They allow us to come in with the lights, side lights on, because otherwise we would be tripping over ourselves. <laughs> we'd be getting lawsuits. But, um, but once we're in our place, they turn off all the lights. It's pitch black, and then they light a single candle. And the Gomonshu that I'll talk about, the abbot of our sect comes in, and he does the entire ceremony with a, just a single candle. So it's kind of cool. Cool atmosphere. Well, and how yes. can they say a nine-year-old child is ordained? Has it done any training? And that's very training or... yeah. So that's very different from now. But back in Japan, um, people were ordained as beginner monks uh, right from the time that they commit to um, becoming a monk. Yeah. Um, and to this day, the monchu, the abbot, can take has the right to take anybody, even if they haven't done any training, and ordain them as a Jodo Shengchu uh, monk priest. So he's the only one who can do it. But if he sees someone who's exceptional, even if uh, now technically they have to be 13 years of age, they can't be nine. Um, but if 13 years and older, you can actually go to Japan. And if you have the right connections, you can get the Monshu, the abbot, to ordain. Oh, that hasn't happened. That's technically. Um, so he studied at, on Mount Hie. Mount Hie is a small mountain right beside Kyoto. He studied in a monastery for 20 years as a Tendai monk. Right? And from the writings from his wife, we know he was what we call a Doso monk. A Doso monk is like a middle level monk. So there's three levels of monks in a Tendai temple. One's called a Gakusho. Gakusho is sort of the highest level. They're usually arist from aristocratic backgrounds. They study, they give lectures, and they write. That's their main purpose in there as a, a monk. Right? So they're living pretty luxurious lives. The lowest low, uh, level is a dosho monk. Dosho monks are like servants. So they do all the cooking, they do all the cleaning, <laughs> they, um, they don't get to chant or they don't get to read very much. They're usually illiterate. And, um, and they're there to serve the rest of the monks of the temple. And the Doso monk, which Shinran was supposed to be, is a middle level monk. So they're the ones that are allowed to practice. So they might read the sutras, but mostly they do chanting, they do meditation, they do various practices. And from the letters that we have, and also from the history about Shinran Shoning, we know that he was a Doso monk, a little middle level monk. And he practiced something called uh, David, you could ask a question. No. Well, I thought you said the Dosho was the lowest. Sorry, he's a Doso. Doso monk. Dosho is the lowest. Oh. Doso is the middle. <laughs> and Gakusho is the oh, elite okay. monks. They hmm. live a luxurious life. So he practiced something and he was quite well known for doing something called Jogyo Zen Mai. Uh, and that's to walk around the Buddha statue for 90 days continuously without lying down. That was the trick. 90 days, you're allowed to stop to eat and of course go to the washroom, but you weren't allowed to lie down. The whole idea of this practice was you would get delirious, of course, not sleeping for 90 days. And, and I'll show you a trick that they did to allow people to sleep a little bit. But you would get in a state of delirium, basically. You would be hallucinating. You, and it is felt that that state of delirium was something close to enlightenment. 
So if you got into that state, then you would be that much closer to getting it right. That's the theory. So this is where Shinran was born uh, in Hino, Japan. There's actually a plaque there. He actually wasn't born in that temple. That's where uh, the closest temple, Hokkai temple. And so it's become famous for Shinran's birthplace. But of course, he was actually born in the neighborhood right next to it. And this is uh, the, the lowest section uh, is a temple in Mount Kie, so a Tendai temple that exists now in Japan. It's not the temple that Shinran practiced because we don't actually know exactly which uh, monastery he practiced in. Uh, this is a Tendai monk today practicing Jo Gou's and Mai. So they still, as Tendai monks, they still do this. Uh, my father had an opportunity to go up to one of the monasteries in uh, Mount Kie. He didn't do it for 90 days, he did it for five days. Uh, five or six days. Uh, so he walked around the Buddha statue for five continuous days uh, without taking a rest. Uh, it took him, well, I can remember when he came back, it took him two weeks to recover from that. But the practice is that you're circumambulating while you're chanting the Buddha's name. So you do it for 90 days, you can take rests for eating and rests to go to the bathroom, but you're not allowed to lie down. That was a trick. And so what did they do? Like, it's not possible for us to survive for 90 <laughs> days without sleeping. So what they would do is there's a bamboo stick that you can see in that picture. They would actually drape their bodies over the bamboo stick, right? And they would actually take cat naps for 20, 30, 40 minutes, several times a day. And by doing that, they were sleeping, but they were not lying down. Mm -hmm. So that must have been extremely uncomfortable to get a cat nap that way. But that's how they did it. So they would survive for the 90 days. Well, many people, of course, monks who try it, they don't survive for 90 days. Or, I mean, they, they give up before the 90 days are up. But um, Shinran was said to have done this several times in his lifetime. And uh, yeah, so it's a pretty remarkable. So if you go to one of the mon Tendai monasteries in Japan, you'll actually see these halls with the bamboo straight across. And you go, well, why do they have bamboo sticks across? And it's because the monks would sleep to take cat naps. So he practiced for 20 years, uh, but after 20 years, as a Tendai monk, he couldn't get anything close to enlightenment, and he was really struggling. He was having an existential crisis after 20 years, and so he decided at that point to do a meditation retreat in a temple called Rokakudo. Uh, Rokakudo is, I'll show you some pictures, but it's actually quite a famous temple in Japan, not only because of Shinran, but for other reasons. Um, so that's common in Japan. Even uh, one of my friends who lives in Japan actually did this about 12 years ago. He was, his wife had just passed away. He was having a crisis about what he should do in his life. And he went to Hokkaido and did a hundred day retreat. So people still do this in Japan to try and sort out their lives, I guess. So Shinran did this. And on the 95th day, it said that he had this dream about Shotoku Taishi, who is the regent of Japan who brought Buddhism to Japan. So he uh, dreamed about Shotoku Taishi as Kanon Bosatsu or Avalokiteshvara. And this, in this dream, this Prince Shotoku said, go seek a, a monk Honen, who is advocating the uh, pure land practice, the Nembutsu practice. And so from that point forward, Shinran then went to seek out Honen, who was a fellow Tendai monk who had left the monastery and he was teaching about the Nembutsu practice and pure land Buddhism. The other actual version of the dream he had is as follows. And it's actually written in a book that was um, that Shinran Shonin helped write. And it's a book all about his different dreams. He had many, many dreams that were felt to be of huge significance and guided him. But this was his dream. If a practitioner is driven by sexual desire because of past karma, then I shall take on the body of a holy woman to be ravished by him. Throughout his entire life, I will adorn him. And at death, I will lead him to the birth in the pure land. So it's actually written in a book called Shinran's Dream. Uh, it was written by one of his followers, but uh, there is evidence that Shinran um, told about all these dreams. So it's a really interesting take on his dream uh, and he was given the name Zenshin by his uh, now new master Onen. So Shinran Shonin 
when he was a 10-9 monk, realized a number of things. He realized that his lifetime was extremely limited as human beings. He really understood the concept of, um, of impermanence. Uh, he felt that his knowledge at that point was extremely limited, that he had very little compassion for the fellow human beings. So he was really struggling with that. Uh, and that his motivations and activities, like his ability to meditate and do the yoga that my was motivated by his greed, anger, and ignorance. He talks about in one of his writings about um, meditating and how after years and years of practicing, he felt that he had made him a really good meditator. But as soon as he thought that, he realized, oh, it's my ego. I'm only meditating for my ego. Uh, so it was because of this real thought process, this and self-evaluation that he decided to actually leave Mount Hia and the Tendai Temple and to join Honen. So the first question that I have for you guys is what do you think about Shinran's dream, especially the dream where he says Kanon will become a woman and uh, why do you think he would have had a dream like that? Guesses, and ideas? Deep within him. So what was deep within him? Well, my understanding is um, Kamu always wanted to relieve suffering. Yes. And ways of relieving. Um, right. So I think there is evidence from the history of Shinran and from various writings that he, one of the things that he was struggling with after self reflection was that he had this great desire for sexual desire. Right. That as a monk, he was supposed to be celibate. And in the history of the Buddhist monks of this era, there's lots of evidence that even though they were supposed to be celibate, many had secret liaisons. And Shinran didn't. But he was really struggling with the fact that he wanted to be sexually active, and he wasn't. And so it's felt that one of the reasons why he had this dream was because of that desire. And how do you overcome that desire? Um, any other comments about the dream? Does it seem a little bit odd or provocative? Well, what were some of his other dreams about? Were they just, you know, uh, like, is this odd, like in the context of what his other ones were? Or um, Yes and no. It's the only one that he mentions uh, Shoshu Kutaishi as um, vowing to become a woman. Mm -hmm. um, Many of his dreams did involve Shoko Taishi um, and Kanon Bosatsu. Um, but I, I don't know the details about all of his other dreams, Margaret. So that would be a good thing to look up for sure. Uh, it's interesting, though, that from his description of the dream, he got the notion that he should go find Honen and study with Honen. And I would have had a hard time sort of trying to figure out, well, how did he get that conclusion from that description of the dream? Anyways, uh, so this is the Okakudo temple in Japan as it exists today. It's a really beautiful temple. It actually became really famous in the late seven, uh, no, I guess it was in the eighties um, in Kyoto. It was became the most visited temple for a short period of time. And the main reason was is so there's an administrative building in Okakudo and they actually built the first Starbucks in Kyoto. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, that's a picture of Avalokiteshvara. So there's many, many statues and figures of Kanon or Avalokiteshvara. Some of them depict uh, them as a woman, some as men. Uh, some you might see have seen images with a, a hundred arms. It's supposed to be a thousand arms, but they have various arms. But there's one way that you could look at a statue. Yeah. Tomiko knows. And you can tell it's Kano or Avalokiteshvara. Yeah, and Tomiko's pointing it out. There's a Buddha statue on his forehead. Right? So if you look up there, there's this little statue of a Buddha. And so if you see a statue or a carving or whatever, a picture even, of a Buddha image or a Bodhisattva with a little statue of the Buddha on top, it's supposed to be Amida Buddha. But if you see that Buddha on top, you know it's Kano or Avalokiteshvara. The Buddha of compassion. 
This is Yoshimizu Tera. Yoshimizu Tera is quite a famous, it's a small, small temple in Japan. Uh, Tomiko, you've been there? I know the name. Yeah. That, so, that doesn't do anything to me. That's no. Um, it's a small temple, but that's where uh, Honen, uh, Shinran's master, practice, set up his practice. And it's, set, it's in Kyoto, in the um, sort of suburb of Kyoto. Um, but it's said that when Honen started practicing, it became like a small village outside of Kyoto. And it became, there was over 10,000 people that moved to Yoshimitsu Tera, one of which was Shinran. So Shinran Shonin became a student of Honen Shonin. And one of the things that higher level monks are allowed to do is they're allowed to copy the writings of their master. And so Shinran Shonin was allowed after a couple of years to copy Honen's major writing, which was a writing called Sin Shakushu. But we don't really know the status of Shinran in terms of Honen's students. Uh, one of the things that happened is it was the persecution of uh, Nembutsu teaching, Pure Land teaching. And so Honen got all of his disciples to sign a seven article pledge, basically saying that they wouldn't um, try to uh, denigrate other Buddhist sects and they would uh, follow the government and all these kinds of things. And so if you look at the signatures of all of his followers, Shinran falls right in the middle. So a higher level monk you would think would have signed at the top. Or it may have been that just the monks were signing it in order that they got uh, the paper. So one of the things that happened in Shinran Shonin's life that really affected him was there was a huge persecution of the Pure Land School. And it was because the Pure Land School became so popular in Japan that uh, many of the other schools like Tendai and Shingon became threatened. They felt like all of their people were converting to Pure Land Buddhism. And so in 1207, after several attempts, there was a formal political ban against the Pure Land teaching and Nembutsu teaching. Um, one of the things, the straw that broke the camel's back was two of Honen's fall disciples actually went to the imperial court and convinced several of the courtesans of the imperial court to convert to pure lab Buddhism or Jovism to Buddhism. And that's the official version. What historically seems to have happened is these two fellows, An Nakubo and Juden, went to the imperial court. Juden was supposed to be two things. He was supposed to be really handsome. He said he was the best looking of all of the disciples of the men. And he was also a great chanter. There's histories written about how if you want to chant, you should be able to chant like Juden. So they have a liaison with uh, courtesans and it's felt that that, and it's probably um, not an innocent liaison, but it is felt that that's what sort of convinced the imperial government, the emperor to then persecute uh, Joro Shinshu Buddhism. And so Andakubo and Juden were executed, they were uh, killed. In fact, two other disciples were felt to have been killed by Honen. And people like Shinran and Honen were taken away their status as a monk. So they were no longer, they were defrocked and they were sent into exile. So Honen was sent into uh, a Hiroshima and Shinran was sent to a place called Ichigo. Yeah. So Ichigo province, I'll show you where it is, but he actually had to leave Kyoto and he went to Ichigo. He had to walk there. So he was stripped of his title as a monk. So he was renamed Fujino Yoshizane. Uh, so that's his fifth name. And, uh, but he chose the name Gotoku Shinma. Gotoku basically means a stubble headed fool. So he said he was neither a monk nor a lay person. He was something in between. So when he moves to es uh, Echigo province, and I'll show you where that is, then he meets up with his wife, his future wife-to-be, and he gets married in 1210. And he had six children, and I'll show you who the children were. Uh, he decides to no longer practice the monk's uh, practices. So he gets married, he eats meat, he even drinks alcohol, which was definitely a no-no for any monk in Japan at that time. And it's said that he did this because he wanted to show that you didn't have to be a monk and follow the 
monthly precepts in order to gain enlightenment. So he wanted to bring Buddhism to the everyday person. So this is a picture of Japan. The red is uh, Echigo province or currently Niigata it's called. And he would have traveled by foot from Kyoto all the way to Echigo. He actually settled on, um, on a temple, in a temple right on the coast. And on that temple, even today, there's actually a shed. And it said that Shinran stayed in that shed for the first uh, six or seven months that he lived in Echigo. So there's a shed still there, although it's been rebuilt. And there's plaques uh, indicating that Shinran stayed there. And then he moved into a town off the coast uh, after about a year. So this is what Echigo looks like. It's a northern sea. It's um, a harsh climate. It's beautiful. Um, I, I haven't actually been there, but uh, people have been there say it's a really a beautiful, it's somewhat isolated, it's still a rural part of Japan. Um, but the winters are really harsh because it's exposed to the northern sea. Um, they get lots of snow and it said that it can get quite cold. And there's the statue of Shinran at that temple where he supposedly stayed in the shed for the first few months. So then he meets uh, Eshini, his wife, he gets married and he has six children. There's another picture of the coastline of Echigo. So he's living in Echigo for six years. He gets pardoned officially. So now he's allowed to be a monk again. It's said that in Echigo, he really didn't develop much of a following because he wasn't actually able to practice as a monk. He wasn't able to proselytize or spread the teachings. Um, but uh, he moves from Echigo after he's pardoned and he doesn't go back to Kyoto, but he decides to go to a place called Kanto, Inago, uh, a town called Inago in Kanto area. That's currently Tokyo. Right? So he goes from the Northern seaside into this uh, Kanto area. And it's from that point forward that he's actually able to propagate the Buddha's teaching, uh, Nembutsu teaching. And it's said that he developed a huge following in Kanto. Uh, it's said that he had well over 10,000 disciples or followers. <clears throat> at that point. Uh, so he stays there for about 16 years. He raises a family and then he returns to Kyoto uh, at the age of 63. And the reason why it said he returned to Kyoto was because he needed access to books. So the, um, in the Kanto area, it was still considered rural. There was no big libraries. So he went back to Kyoto so that he could research the sutras and do his major writing. And then he dies at the age of 90 in 1263. So that's the Kanto area. Inago is just in the northern part of it. It's right. Uh, it's part of where Tokyo is now. Uh, just one other incident about Shinran's life. Uh, he actually disowns his oldest son. So his, he had a daughter who's the oldest, but his oldest son, Zenran, um, it's speculated that he may not have been from his wife, uh, from uh, Echigo, uh, Eshini. Um, because in some of Zenran's writing, he refers to Eshini as his stepmother. Although there's a lot of historians who believe that he said that because he was in a bit of a fight with Shinran and Eshini, and so he might have used that as a derogatory term. But we don't know for sure. Um, but Zenran was actually sent from the Kyoto area back to Kanto area because of this huge uh, divergent teaching that was developing. It was called licensed evil. The whole idea was Shinran kept saying that the Buddhist teachings are for evil people. And so the followers, some of the followers in Kanto said, well, if it's for evil people, we can do whatever we want. It could be as bad as we want in the teachings for us, so we will be forgiven. And so Shinran sends his son Zenran to sort of quash this uh, divergent teaching. And when Zenran gets to uh, Kanto area, where a huge number of Shinran's followers are still present, uh, he starts saying that um, what you heard from Shinran is not the true teaching. I have the secret teaching, that, and Shinran only told me. So if you want to be a fall, real follower, you need to come under my guidance. Right? And so Shinran heard this, and after warning Zenran several times that you shouldn't be doing this, 
he then actually disowned Sandra. So he sent him a letter in 1265, and this is what it says. Hence, from now on, there shall no longer exist parental relations with you. I cease to consider you my son. I declare this resolutely uh, to the three treasures. It is sorrowful thing. It rends my heart to hear that you have devoted yourself to misleading all the people of the Nembutsu in Hitachi, saying that what they have been taught is not my true teaching. Rumors have reached as far as Kamakura that I have instructed you to denounce the people in Hitachi who say the Nembutsu. It is deeply deplorable. So that was a, uh, Shinran considers that the most difficult thing that happened in his life, that he had to disown his uh, oldest son. So what do you think about that? And there is a history, and I'll show you a little bit of the history about these leading figures in Jodo Shinshu disowning their oldest son. It actually happened four times in history. Uh, and I don't know if it was because of the trend that Shinran set. What do you think about that? So here's his son sent to Kanto to try and quell this teaching. And then he says, oh, I've, but I've got the real secret teaching of the Shinran. And so Shinran says, after several warnings, he says, okay, that's it. You're no longer my son. A little harsh. Well, it was a different time where the, the father was the ruler of the family. Then. Right. Yeah. Nowadays, kids are much more have much more freedom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, some historians have felt that it was a little harsh that he could have given more leeway. Um, one of the things that has been said is that Shinran should have brought Zenron back to Kyoto. Uh, you know, to talk to him and try to convince him that what he was doing was wrong, but, but he never did. That would uh, state to the, all the people that he was wrong. Yes. The son and was misleading the uh, people. Yeah. So that, uh, that would uh, cut off the Christians of who's right and who's wrong. So, and, and uh, actually, Sure, man, because uh, he revived uh, uh, the uh, Jain Buddhism. Uh, uh, he had to do things like that. Right. So as he was the leader. Yeah. The interesting thing is that Zen Nan's teachings actually survive today. So there's a society in Japan called the Secret Buddhist Society. <laughs> and uh, we don't know how many members they have because it's secret <laughs> and they don't have temples. Um, but it's felt that there's um, even up to a half a million followers in Japan and they meet in secret. They don't have temples. So they actually announce that they're going to meet in a hall or whatever, and they change the locations. And that secret Buddhist society actually stems from Zen. So he had the secret teachings that he supposedly spread and there's still a significant number of followers. And this is Shinran's gravesite. It's Otani Hongyo, uh, and it's in Kyoto. Uh, the nice thing is, is that it's actually four, four blocks away from my mother's temple in Japan. So we used to go there as kids. Uh, we would actually even go up there to have picnics. Uh, it's a beautiful hall. And right behind this main hall is my mom's family's gravesites. So my grandfather, my grandmother, uncles, and great grandfather, great grandmother are buried there. Uh, so it's literally like just right behind that main hall building. And the other thing that's cool about uh, Old Tiny Homyo, where Shinran is buried, is this, this big square urn. It's quite massive. Uh, you've seen it? The, yeah. So this urn is where Shinran Shonin's ashes are buried. And the idea is if you get permission, you can actually take your ashes, well, not you, but your family can take your ashes and have it buried along with Shinran's ashes. So you can be one with Shinran Shomi. Do you know if, how Higashi Hongo is just near there, not far? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Or Higashi Otani? Yeah, yes, yes. They also claim his ashes are there. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if his well, ashes were actually My split. parents' ashes were taken there because dad's temple happened to be a near, near 
one of those temples was under the Hilashi. Oh, okay. So it wasn't a choice. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if Shinran's ashes were split when the Honganji split, if his ashes were also split. I feel good. Uh, it's usually I think it's in there. So thank you. Thank you. Sylvia's doing the flowers. What, what was shocking to me was these mountains full of headstones. Headstones, yeah. It's just a whole mountain mm -hmm. on both sides. Yeah, there's about 2,000 headstones at Otani Hokyo. And it's not for individual people because it's usually a family headstone. Right. But then they place a little in the, in the main one. Right. You have to get special permission. Yes. Uh, well, you have to. Yeah. You. Is it hard to do? Like, you have to be. Uh, apparently, it is. So there's quite a few Canadians who are buried. Uh, Ashton. Well, not quite a few. Uh, over the years, the bishop has to give consent. So you have to, if as a family, you have to write to the bishop. He has to give consent, and he has to write Nishihonganji and Otani Hongyo. And the permission is given back, and then usually they have a special ceremony when your ashes are buried there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's actually a specific columbarium for Canadians in Otani mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, uh, so the next thing I'm going to talk about, and I'm running out of time already, is uh, Shinran Shonin's innovation. So it was felt that Shinran Shonin was a huge innovator in terms of the pure land teaching, and I'm going to quickly go through some of his innovations, but the first innovation was that in his idea, this Amina Buddha, the story of Amina Buddha, the central figure that we revere, was actually not a person or a real being, that it represents true reality or ultimate reality. Okay, so that's idea number one. And that was a revolutionary thought because Pure Land Buddhists up to that point thought the story of the Amida Buddha was a real story about a historical being that existed billions of years ago. Now, the second idea is the whole idea of Shinjin. And I'll explain that a little bit more in detail. So Shinjin is having an entrusting heart and mind towards the compassion of the Buddha. So believing that this Amida Buddha, this ultimate true reality, that you will become a one with that reality when you die. And so Shinran said that is the main way that we enter the Pure Land, that we get into the Pure Land. So, that Shinjin having an entrusting heart and mind is a true cause of breath, uh, birth in the pure land. And that the Nembutsu, saying the Nembutsu, is just a grateful response for this compassion, of understanding this compassion. Up until that point, most pure land Buddhists said the Nembutsu was the most important practice. Saying the name of the Buddha over and over again was critical for you to get into the pure land. So if you said the name even once, you could get into the pure land. Where Shinran said, no, saying the name isn't that important. Well, he said it was important, but the critical thing is to trust in the vow of Amida Buddha. The third point that he made was Tariki, that relying on the other power, Amida's compassion, was much more important than trying to gain enlightenment for yourself. So Jiriki. The fourth major teaching was is that the teachings, the Buddha's teaching and Amida's compassion, is specific is directed more towards the evil person than the good person, right? So I'll explain that. Um, and then I'll skip to the sixth. Um, he really emphasized this whole idea of the bodhisattva path, that when you become enlightened and get, get into the pure land, you return to this world to try and help all other beings. So you don't stay in the pure land, but you come back to help all other beings. So those were his six major innovations. So the first, I think I explained fairly well, Amida Buddha is not a historical person, is not a historical being, but it represents ultimate true reality. Um, the way that I like to think of it in a simplistic way is it's like the force in Star Wars, right? So may the force be with you. It's a very sort of similar concept. Um, and it's not a specific figure or historical person. Uh, and it's a symbol of the ultimate reality. And that was quite innovative. Uh, as I explained, Shinjin having a grateful and accepting and trusting heart um, for the Buddha's teaching is what allows you to become born in the Pure Land. And that Nembutsu 
even though up until that point, Nemba2 was felt to be primary, Nemba2 is just a great for response. Uh, I just wanted to talk about Nemba2 because we really haven't said much about it. I've had you, everybody you know, put their hands together and say Namami Nemba2. What the actual translation is, I take refuge in the Amida Buddha. I take refuge in the Buddha of infinite light and life. So reciting the Nembutsu is an outward expression of being grateful or accepting the Buddha's teaching. Um, and it's said that it's meant to be a spontaneous, it's like saying, wow, when you see a rainbow, right? You say, wow, that's a beautiful rainbow. Your automatic response is wow. In the same way, saying the Nembutsu is an automatic or spontaneous reflection of your gratitude in knowing that Amida, that we will become one with the ultimate reality that we pass away. Um, the other notion that Shinran really emphasized, which was relatively, it wasn't completely novel, but he really emphasized it, is that reliance on the other power is primary and that your self-effort, your own um, self-power to become enlightened wasn't fruitful. Right? If you tried to become enlightened for yourself and practice, meditated and all that, it wasn't likely to be fruitful that you had to rely on the compassion of Amida Buddha. Uh, and then probably the one that's talked about the most in terms of Shinran's innovation is this whole idea that the teaching and Shinran uh, and the Buddha's compassion is actually directed more towards the evil person than the good person. So that's counterintuitive what we think, right? We think that a good person, <coughs> they do good deeds, they're generous, they're kind. Their reward should be that they get born into the pure land. But what Shinran said is, no, that's actually not true. It's actually the evil person who is um, the focus of Amida Buddha's compassion. And how does that make sense? So the analogy is if you are a parent and you have a whole bunch of kids and you love your kids all equally, but whose attention gets focused on uh, the most is the sickest child. Right. So you might love your kids equally, but the child who is the sickest, who is suffering the most, is the one that the parents tend to focus on. And so what Shinran said is, is that the teaching of the Buddha was really focused on those who are suffering the most, who are karmically. So the marginalized people in our society. And so how much more so um, an evil person will be born into the pure lab rather than the good person, right? And that's sort of putting the whole idea of uh, who the teaching is directed to on its head. And there's many, many writings about why this is the case. And then the third, or the, the next thing that Shinran really emphasizes is Bodhisattva path. The idea that when you become enlightened, when you go into the pure land, you don't stay there, that you actually return as part of the ultimate reality, as um, to try and help all other beings uh, gain enlightenment and to end their suffering as well. So those were the main innovations. <clears throat> um, there are many works uh, that Shinran wrote over his lifetime from the age of 63. If you want to see a collection of his works in English, there, we have several copies of this at the back. So this is the collected works of Shinran that Nishigai Hongachi put together. Um, about 20 years ago now. So all of his works, major works are in this collection and it's you know, quite a thick volume. And then there's a second volume, which is, a, which is an explanation of all of his works and the appendixes and all that, right? So if you want to read his works, you can read it through here. I haven't read it completely, I've read sections of it. Um, his major opus magnum is something called Kyogyo Shinsho or Kenjo do Shinjitsu Kyogyo Mondui. <laughs> and in English, it's, the translation is a true teaching practice. And I put Shinjin because it's actually not part of the title, but it's implied and realization of the pure land way. Uh, so Kyogyo Shinsho. And we chant something in our service called Shoshinge, Shoshin Nembutsuge. It actually comes from this major works, Kyogyo Shinsho. So on page 69 of this, if anybody wants to have a look at it. And so this chat that we do, this Shoshinge, 
is a summary of all of Shinran's major teachings. So he talks about the importance of the teaching, about Shinjin, and he talks about the seven masters, and he talks about the three, land, uh, three pure land sutras in it. Uh, there's a shorter version of the Kyogyo Shinsho that we're not sure if he wrote it before or after, but it's called The Passage on the Pure Land Way, Jodo Mondui Sho, Jusho. And then there's several hymns that he wrote, many, many hymns or poems uh, about the Pure Land Masters, about the Pure Land itself, about the Dharma Ages. Um, so he wrote many, many poems, and there are many letters that he wrote as well, and they're all contained in here. So if anybody wants them, uh, there's copies. What's like the main part of that children's teacher written after he was 80? Uh, that's the theory, although there is a extant um, drafts of Kyogyo Shinsho from when he was in his 60s. Okay. So he refined it. He continued to refine it through all of his life. And so the final version probably didn't come out until he was 80, uh, 82, actually. Um, but the initial versions of it were written when he was in his 60s. So I'm going to talk a little bit about two other figures in Buddhism, uh, Jodo Shinshu. First is Eshing Nin. So Eshing Nin was Shinran's wife, as I've mentioned earlier. That's a picture of her. Uh, they were married in 1210 in Echigo. That's where Shinran probably met her. Um, she was um, the daughter of a samurai, high-ranking samurai. And so they actually were landowners. So they owned a fair bit of land in Echigo. And it was because of her financial support to him and his family that he was able to continue to practice. So remember, he's defrocked when he was sent into exile. He had no way of earning a living for himself. And he actually had to rely on his wife, uh, his new wife. He had six children, as I mentioned. The oldest was Oguro, who was his daughter, but Zenran was the oldest son. Myoshin was the second son. And Kakushinin, the last one, is his youngest daughter that we'll talk about, who lived in... Uh, she lived in Kyoto with Shinran until 1254, but after 1254, they split. So Shinran stays in Kyoto, and she actually returns to Echigo because at that point, her parents died. And they were landowners. They had several servants, actually slaves. Um, and she had to return back to administer and look after the property and the, and the uh, servants and, and their families. Um, and during that time, after she returns to Echigo, she writes about how hard life is. One year, for example, because of a famine, she loses two of her major servants, but also many other family members. And so it's a real time of famine and epidemics and real hardship. And one of the letters that she wrote, she says, I may be going to the land of bliss at any moment. This is to her daughter. In the land of bliss, we will be able to see everything clearly. So I hope that you shall live the life of Nembutsu and come to join me there. That's what she wrote to her daughter. So a series of her letters was actually discovered in Honganji in the archives in 12, uh, 1921. So that's like uh, some 700 years after uh, she was alive. And uh, there were letters between her and her daughter. And they really described about Shinran's life, uh, how hard it was to live in the Kamakura period. And um, one of the things that happened was it was a great debate whether Shinran actually really did get into the Pure Land. Because at that time in Japan, it was said that especially religious leaders like Shinran, when they pass away and go into the Pure Land, there's these magical things that happen. Purple smoke appears or purple clouds. Uh, music appears, heavenly music appears as the person's passing away. Figures of the Buddhas come into the room um, and Kakushini and his daughter said well none of that happened when my dad died he just died and so Eshinin said now there's no doubt that your father was born into the pure land there's no need for me to reiterate this so Eshinin firmly believed that her husband um, Shinran uh, went into the pure land yes so do you think that was a arranged marriage um there is some theory that it was no, definitely. Um, Why would that samurai with all this wealth want his daughter to marry her? A defrocked. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think there's any history around <laughs> how they met, for example, and what led to them. Um, 
preparing. Um, I think as one of Honen's disciples, though, that Nembutsu, Nembutsu teaching the Pure Land Buddhism started to become very popular in Japan. And so it was maybe because he was associated with that, that his father of Eshinin would have wanted, but I, I don't know. That's a good question to throw. There are often political arrangements too, right? Except for Shinran wasn't of any real political status at that time. No, but for there were no reasons why he could have been married. There is a theory that actually Eshinin and Shinra met before he was exiled, that they actually met in Kyoto and had a courtship there, and then subsequently got married in, when he was exiled. In fact, there's a theory, ongoing theory, that Shinra was sent to Echigo specifically because Eshinin's family was there. And that was the reason why he was exiled to that place, because in the history, they, they couldn't figure out well, why would the imperial government send them to that place rather than somewhere else. That, that was quite specific. There is also the theory that Shinran moved from Echigo to Kanto area, to the Tokyo area, because Eshini actually had, her family had property in Kanto. There's pretty good evidence that he moved there for economic stability, partly, because his family were landowners, his wife's family were landowners. So the youngest daughter of Shinran is Kakushinmi. Uh, she was married at the age of 15 to one of Shinran's followers, actually. Uh, so her husband's name was Hino Hiro Tsuna. He was 20, over 20 years older than her when they got married. So that's a pretty young age, but that was pretty common in Japan. She has her first son when she's 16, just before she turned 16, and his name was Kakue. And then Hino Hiro Tsuna dies um, after six years. So she was only 22 at the time when her husband dies. So then she moves back with her father, Shinran, and her mom, Eshini. And it said that Kakue, her oldest son uh, from the marriage, was actually raised by Eshini and Shinran. So it said that he actually learned a lot about Shinran's teaching, basically from the age that he was about six or seven until he was in his early 20s. So he was taught by Shinran. Um, then Shinran passes away. Uh, Kakushinin spends about 12, 13 years looking after her, her dad. Um, and then after he passes away, she remarries. Uh, and she remarries a fellow by the name of Zenmen. She has two sons from that second marriage, one of who is Yui Zen. The oldest son is Yui Zen. So Zenmen was a landowner. He owned quite a bit of land in Kyoto at the time. So when he passes away, he gives all, uh, some of his property to his wife, Kakushinmi, right? So he bestows that upon her. And an interesting happen, a thing happened. So when Shinran passes away, he's actually buried in the mausoleum and the people in Kanto, his followers, build a shrine for him. Uh, and then Eshinmi, uh, Kakushinmi, sorry, takes that shrine and it move, she moves it to her property uh, the one that her husband gave her. Right? So this building belongs to the people of Kanto, but the land belongs to her now. And what she does is something very unusual. She actually wills that land, not to her son, but she wills it to the followers of Kanto, the, the, the Sangha, the, the congregation. And she did that for a particular reason. Um, then she appoints herself and all of the, or the firstborn descendant from her to be the caretakers of this shrine, this temple, and this land, right? So she's the official caretaker. And the reason why it was felt that she did that was that the people in Kanto own the land now, they own the building, but she's appointed as the caretaker. So they would feel a responsibility to help financially support her and whoever takes over the temple, right? But, a problem occurs in that her first son, Kakwe, from her first marriage, and the first oldest son from her second marriage have a fight about who should officially be the caretaker and the leader of the Jodo Chicha temple. So they actually, Yui Zen, the son from her second marriage, actually occupies this temple uh, building and says, I should be the rightful caretaker because it's my dad's lab that was donated. And so there's a big political fight, and finally it's settled. But Kakue actually dies just after it's settled that he should be the official caretaker. And then he names his son 
Kakunyo as a successor. That story goes on through the temples. Yeah, so there's quite a long history about how there was this fight, and it actually took the head abbot of uh, the biggest temple in Japan to actually settle that, who was going to take over. So Kakunyo is Kakushinin's uh, grandson, Shinran's great grandson, officially gets appointed as the caretaker. But he's the one who actually changes the Jodo Shinsha sect into an actual school of Buddhism. So he requests that it become an official temple, doesn't it? And he gives it the name Jodo Shinshu Honganjiha. So he's actually the first person who actually politically appoints Jodo Shinshu as a school of Buddhism and names it. And then he also changes his title. So he's supposed to be just a caretaker, but then he changes his title to be what they call Monshu, the abbot or the religious head of that sect of Buddhism. And so he's considered the third Monshu or the third abbot of our sect. Uh, I'm just going to skip that. And um, I was going to go through this, but these are the different abbots. So Shinran is the founder of our sect of Buddhism. Kakunyo, the great grandson of Shinran, is the third abbot. Nyoshin was the second son. Uh, so remember, the first son, Zenran, is disowned. So the second son gets appointed. Um, and then down and down and down. And then we get to the 11th abbot, Kenyo. And it's at this point that Nishihon Ganji is split. So there's a huge political turmoil between um, two people in Japan, political leaders, Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Basically, what happens is, is that the political, the warlords of Japan felt very threatened by Honganji because it becomes so popular. And so 75% of Japan's population is Jodo Shinshu at this point, but they also have a huge fighting force. They have these um, warrior monks uh, in amongst the temple, and they were supposed to be a huge military force as well. And so the daimyos, the uh, shoguns at the time felt threatened by Nishihonji, one, because of its popularity, and two, because of its fighting force. So what happens is, is that Kenyo, at one point, is fighting against Oda Nobunaga. Um, he finally gives up his place in Osaka, and um, a fellow by the name of Tomo, Toyotomi Hideyoshi actually gives Kenyo a land, the current land where Nishonganji exists in Kyoto. But he has a fight with his son. Kenyo, um, his son doesn't want to give up the land and doesn't want to give up the fight. So he continues to fight over Nobunaga and Kenyo disowns him. Remember I said there was many times when the oldest son is disowned. And then the next person who comes into political power is a fellow by the name of Tokugawa Ieyasu, the current shogun show is about him. So he makes a political move. He takes the older son who is disowned and he says, I'm gonna give you this plot of land and I want you to divide the followers of Jodo Shinshu into two. So one in the East and one in the West. And so from that point forward, from the second at uh, the 12th Monshu, the Honganji is split into an East and West side. It was mostly a political thing. And, um, and it was smart on uh, part of to Tokugai Ieyasu, the shogun, because he essentially took a really strong political force and military force and divided it into two, right? And so the strength of Honganji as a sect of Buddhism weakened, especially militarily, right? And in terms of its influence on the popular people in Japan. So then we go all the way down to the 24th. We're at the 25th. Uh, Monchu, our head of the Nishihonganji now, his name is Senyo. Uh, there's a picture inside of our hall, I meant to bring it in. But, and the 24th uh, Monchu or abbot uh, in Japan is uh, Sokunyo. And Sokunyo is um, actually, uh, he did a couple of things that were unusual. He gave up his title as Monchu at a relatively young age when he was only 72. And most Monchus die before they pass on the title. Uh, so he retired. Uh, he was also actually, um, my father actually taught him English. So when my father was learning to become a monk and doing his, some of the schooling in Japan, uh, that's when Sokunyo was in his early 20s. 
And he really wanted to learn English. And so as my father was in Japan, he actually ended up being his English teacher for about three years. Uh, so he would see him twice a week to teach him English lessons. So to this day, uh, my mom and Sokunyo still exchange New Year's cards and New Year's presents. Uh, I remember my mom having the package, and it wasn't really elaborate things, boxes of Rice Krispie, coffee crisp chocolate bars, and she would send it to Japan to the Monshu. And then he was just here recently after he retired, did a tour of U.S., didn't come to Canada, but he flew into Vancouver specifically just to meet my mom. Uh, so, um, so he came and visited her last year, it was. Uh, so that was really nice. So they, we still have a fairly strong family. Point. I mean, I've only met him a couple of times and haven't really spoken to him. But uh, my mom corresponds with him pretty regularly. So that's it in terms of time. Do people have questions about Shinran Shoni and specifically Jodo Shinshu? How about people from the Temple of Zoom. I have a comment. Sure. Um, I think li listening to these last two sessions of history, it makes me think of um, uh, a religion course that I took where it really says that religions are defined by their place and time that they develop. Um, so yeah, they're, the teachings can really be... Um, molded by the situations that they're incubated in. Yes, that's very true. Um, just for those who want to learn more about Shinran, there's two books, Shinran and an Introduction to His Thoughts. This is a little bit more of an academic book, um, but it really talks about his life, but it goes into his philosophy and his innovations quite a bit more. Um, and then for those of you who don't really want an academic historical account, there is The Monk Who Dared by Ruth Tabra. And this is more like a novel style book. I've um, written it, so really. Sorry? <laughs> Backwards, that's <sweet>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you get it. Oh, I have to reverse the mirroring. And then if people want to read a shorter version of um, some of Shinran's idea, there's this book. Um, it's written by Jeff Haynes, Applying Shinran's Radically Engaged Buddhism in Life and Society. One thing he did, he was strong, but he never, he continued to wear his uh, robes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's true. And to shave his head. Although as a monk, you would have to have it clean shaven. Oh, and during the... Three years that he was in exile, it's shown, it's depicted, it's said anyways, that he had like a crew cut. So very short hair, but not quite clean shaven. To sort of signify that he was not quite a monk, not quite a lay person. Long ago, I think, I don't know who the uh, director was, but there was a movie, and I think the translation was White Stand. Oh. Not sure why and that would be. He showed the severe times that Shima lived in in the north. Mm -hmm. the yeah. Cloud. Life in Echigo was definitely quite uh, difficult. As it would be. Yeah. Where you show the prefecture, Echigo is right next to the, uh, the prefecture that has an earthquake. Yes. Yeah. It's very close to Sendai. Yeah. Any other comments, questions, concerns? So next time we're going to cover uh, the seven masters, the seven masters, the lineage of how the Pure Land teachings were passed on through generations. And we're going to talk about the three Pure Land sutras, so the main sutras that, uh, as Jodo Shinshu Buddhists, were meant to follow. A lot of information. Yes, sorry. Tons this time. <laughs> So it will be available on the website, or? Uh, yes. Uh, well, so I'll make this available on YouTube. Uh, so I'll copy it over onto YouTube as well. And then, as I said before, if people want the slides, if you could let me know, send me an email, and I can send you the slides. I'd like the slides. OK. <laughs> I just got to really wonder what Shinran would have thought of the evolution of it to a, you know, a military group in the 1600s. 
And we can go into that a little bit more. I think he would have been quite dismayed. Um, in his writings, he actually made it clear that he didn't feel that he was a leader of a religious organization, that he did not, uh, he didn't even feel that he was um, a religious teacher, uh, that he should not have any disciples. Uh, he made it very clear that he felt that the institutionalization of religion was not a good thing. You know, during the, the period where um, the arm I mean, the military was so strong, yes, and, and they escaped and they built for protection, reminds me of what's happening in Israel. But they built temples. You know, Teramachi. Mm. Tera means temple. Temple towns. They, they had lots of temples along the street, and um, military people. He did them. And, you know, they were, they uh, assumed the, the role of monks, but they were really militaristic. And that uh, street used to fascinate me. You know, it's now just a lot of shops. But, uh, there is um, a history in Japan, particularly around the Kamakura period. So the time that Shogun, the current Sho Shogun is based, um, where the Buddhist temples and the followers had a huge number of warrior monks. Uh, they became quite a strong military force in Japan. So if you want to hear the story about that, and in fact, there was a bit of a revolution called Ikoiki, um, where the followers supported farmers and fishermen, and they actually fought against the, uh, the um ruling government at the time, they didn't want to pay taxes, they wanted to become more independent, didn't want to follow any of the rules. And in, a, in the Kanto area, they were actually quite successful at, um, at basically gaining control of that area. And one of the things that happened that uh, put the current, or sorry, the uh, um, one of the shoguns into power was there was a huge battle between this Ikoiki group and the uh, and the military government. Uh, I don't like the freedom. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Did I forget at the beginning? Oh, we did at the beginning. So if you could put your hands together and just show. No more we don't. No more we don't. No more we don't. Thanks, Sheila. <laughs> oh.